So, hi everybody and welcome to Mish Talk. Today we are in Creston, Iowa at Fox Fest, which is at Southwestern Community College for their Vocal Jazz Festival. And I'm here with my dear friend, longtime friend, and mentor, Phil Matson. And hi, Phil. Hi, Mish. <laughs> and you all know Phil because he is a a primary guru of vocal jazz and one of the most wonderful arrangers in vocal jazz, having written for what the Real Group, the Four Freshmen, the Manhattan Transfer, etc. You know, yes. And I, I resent being called a guru <laughs> because that's a guy who's on the mountain somewhere I see. in uh, India. Yeah. It has wisdom. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And I've discovered yeah. that wisdom. It's overrated, of course. It's overrated, mm -hmm. and you finally end up knowing that you don't know anything, and that's the ultimate wisdom. There you go. And that's, that's right. why we're talking to you right. to learn the, the gems of life yes. like that. Right. <clears throat> You can um, know about D minor seventh, right? Mm -hmm. D F A C. Uh huh. Let's see. Let me think. D. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just not. That's just information. It's not wisdom. Mm -hmm. Wisdom would be to understand how D, D minor seventh relates to everything in music. The, co the cosmos. The existential. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. To God and, and right. And, right. The afterlife. I mean, that's hard to know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know that you do a lot of thinking when you're on your Harley uh, back in the day, all those I'm still long writing. trips. You're yeah. still writing. Yes. Uh, honest nice. gosh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm writing to Alaska this summer. You are? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. What's in Alaska that you want it's to It's just, it's, it's not journey, in Alaska, right? it's the journey, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's beautiful. Another, another pearl of wisdom. What's that? <clears throat> It's the journey. It's the journey. Uh, right? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that wisdom. I appreciate that. <laughs> so Phil is here, and we are, um, we're, we're doing a concert tonight. And if we survive that, we're going to do a concert tomorrow night, too. Right? That'll well, that's what we're engaged fun. to do, right? Yes. We're taking money for this. Oh, when we get Aren't paid we, for it. Gonna pay. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, they're going to pay us. Oh, something. Well, you know, man does not live by music alone. <laughs> right. We, we have to pay for gasoline for That's the Harley. Right. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And cameras and... <laughs> right. All the gear. Yes. Yeah. And plus my, you know, my lipstick and... My, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you have a hairdresser and a makeup person traveling with you, right, all the time? Oh, yeah, I've got my team. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard to support all those people. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Phil, uh, let me say right now that you have been, um, as you know, my mentor since I was 16 years old. And if I didn't happen to grow up around Foothill College in California and stumble upon a jazz class that you were teaching and hear a concert serendipitously that you were doing, I would still be working at a bookstore in um, Mountain View, California at this point in life probably and so um, I, don't, I doubt that <laughs> but obviously uh, different people have influence on, influences on us and it depends upon timing you know timing is is it yeah. and uh, lots of people probably threw out wisdom at me, and I, I couldn't hear it, right, at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I think, I think you're just a natural, and it would, have, it would have come out, maybe in a different way, you know. You might have been really famous as a singer, songwriter, guitar player, <laughs> instead of a jazz musician that has such a relatively small. That's what public. I mean. Look at how you held me back. I know. That's, that's what I'm saying. I could have been playing the big uh, venues. I could have moved to Des Moines yeah. and done that. I'll get serious. It should be moment to get serious. <laughs> there is no need for seriousness okay. in life now or 
No. Or ever, really. But but said, well, but you know, since you asked, um, I would be curious to know what you're up to uh, now, and then we can work backwards. What's what's going on in life for you now that's important to you? Well, um, this chance to perform with you that certainly is important, and the uh, preparation we've spent getting ready for this. Several songs that I didn't know before, and you didn't know either, right? Many uh, of the songs we're yeah, doing I didn't right, know. Right. Mm -hmm. I might have known the name of them, but I didn't know them. And uh, I have a group in Minneapolis called the Film Hats and Singers, uh, which I really love, you know. I love directing a vocal jazz group. Really? Oh, yeah. You couldn't tell it. No. I never knew that. Never, never knew that, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, back in the day, when you were in the film, at the PM Singers it was. Yes. You were all 20 and 21 years old. I know. Yeah. And it was a difficult thing, not musically, but just because you were young. And, and uh, How many other groups, oh, excuse me. Sure. How many other groups at that time do you recall that were singing harmony that was that complex live? Because the Singers Unlimited existed, the High Lows, the Four Freshmen, the Modern Airs, et cetera, and they sang four-part chords. We were a six-voice group, but it was before many of the other fantastic groups came along, certainly way before the real group, even before Take Six, before New York Voices, and there was a moment in there. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think we were, we were at, we were the leader at that point, I really think, because the real group was not yet formed, and uh, uh, well, there were, you know, there were, certainly were the Swingle Singers. Manhattan Transfer. And, and, yes, but that was a four-voice group, right. and their har harmony was mostly not quite as complex. Mm -hmm. Not always, because they sang body and solo, and that mm -hmm. was a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think there was a time there in uh, 83, 4, 5, 6, where we, we were kind of leading way in terms of what you could do live uh, in performance and, you know, really do it well. And that was because that group was so, was individually talented and also young and really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And you were not in the group initially, but you were actually in the group the very first year we got serious, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because uh, so Andy Doctor was Andy a, Doctor was was a original the, member. Right. Yeah. And that was during the time you had the film ads in school, private school, up in Spokane, Washington. Right. And so we had, uh, I remember we had nothing else distracting us that much, and we were very school-centric. We, the, we were all teaching that group at your right. school. Right. Yeah. And uh, we learned a lot through that teaching process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, everybody had talent, but not everybody had an academic education. And uh, we had a recording studio. And that was pretty cool. Yes. Back then to have, mm -hmm. in 1983, to have a 24 track studio right. you know, that was available to us yeah. 24 hours a day. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's something about that recording studio experience that really is educational. Mm -hmm. You know, you just can't hide. And when you guys did that first recording in the summer when I was, I had done the rhythm practice and you did it, mm -hmm. it was just, I know you, I know you. You were just merciless about. And we all spent a lot, of, whole heap of hours in the studio because it was before the time of auto tune right. and melodyne and so on, as I recall. And you had to cut tape. 
two inch tape. We were using two inch tape, so there was literally razor blade splicing of right. the tape going on. And you had on. to punch in just exactly right. Yes, so we were dealing with not clipping the breaths and everything very meticulously. And um, I remember we, uh, we did things over and over, I mean phrase by phrase, over and over and over and over again to try to get it right. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't be so difficult nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's still difficult, you know, because that energy that you guys put in, mm -hmm. even after repeating a phrase, you know, six times or whatever, that's the hardest thing, you know. Yes. Yeah, the, hard, the hardest thing is to get it to sound natural and right. musical in that context. Right. And I think today that's still the hardest thing for groups. I think there's a real trap with vocal groups using technology to, too much, you know, and then sacrificing the natural... Excitement. Yeah. You know, right. live, yeah. live excitement. Yeah, yeah. And well, if the technology is there, it's going to get used. Yeah. That's, yes. Phil, so I remember that... I remember a lot of things about you, and I think of you, I won't call you a guru, because I know that you're yeah. anti-guru-ish, but uh, I will say that uh, over the many, many years that we've done hundreds and hundreds of events together, and concerts and events, and mm -hmm. covered people, you can hear a pin drop always. Really? Yeah. You speak, and people listen to you. Oh. Undoubtedly. There's something... There's a profoundness when you communicate to groups, and along with that, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about it, that, that uh, profound quality that you have. You are also a character in the background. We've talked about the Harley Davidson uh, factor, um, but I remember a game called Hearts that you play. Right. Hearts, yeah. Hearts, and, it's, and then there's a thing called shooting the moon in Hearts, which is where you basically take the biggest risk, and if you succeed at the biggest risk, risk, which is almost impossible, then you win everything. Right. And you would shoot the moon four times in a row. When, no. Yes, you would. You would do it. Well, I, well. I was with you, and you did it at least twice. Did you? And I, I, mean, yeah. I think you were doing it a lot. and. So that tells me you were taking the risk and you were also smart enough to succeed at it. You ha play a mighty game of pool. Well, you are, you're, you're somewhat of a pool shark yourself. Yeah, not I like think. you. Well, um, you're it's a, a sign of a misspent youth. There's no, no, absolutely, it's, absolutely, it's a yeah. capital T and a capital P. Yes, uh, you know, exactly. Trouble Robert and Preston. All that. Right. Yes, and Meredith Wilson. And then there's Krishnamurti and your 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 sense to your love and passion for reading great phil philosophical thought. No pun intended on the philosophical right. philosophical. But uh, I know you even went to Krishnamurti's. Uh, there's a center in Ojai, California, right. and uh, spent some time there. It's. I mean, I could go on and on, and I won't. Yes. But. Uh, You've led an interesting life and uh, are a deep thinker. Well, you know, it's with music, if music moves us, you know, without any real reward, you know, in other words, if just hearing a chord or something just thrills you. Um, it's really difficult to be objective about music then, right? Many great thinkers have said that, have extolled music's importance to mankind and its ability to communicate what can't be communicated with words. and. Uh, so it just struck me that if I was going to do music, I really needed to figure that out in some way, or work at it, trying to understand how music, how music, why music is so um, so 
why it moves people so easily. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so, as I say, so in the end you find out you still don't know. I mean, so what is its purpose? Uh, I guess it, it doesn't really need a purpose. It's, it's enjoyable and uh, it has beauty or ugliness for that matter. There's some pretty ugly music like Duke Ellington and there's good or bad, right? <laughs> and there is bad, B-A-D bad. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't want to say what's bad because uh, that's going to be different for Mm -hmm. for anybody and uh, yeah so um, I think it's important to uh, to at least think seriously about that is it about communicating primarily is it about presenting some gift of integrity you know creativity integrity uh, Yeah. What, um, what moves you, when are you the most moved in music? See, I don't, un I <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer how to answer that. It just comes, it comes when you least expect it in a way, because you're doing music and, uh, you know, much of it is routine, you know, we're, we're performing uh, what's the name oh, what's the name of the Cole Porter song yeah. at long last love mm -hmm. yeah we're performing that and we've performed it many times and uh, never the same exactly but sometimes something just occurs well you know and so that there's a magical moment or two or three it usually, it's hard to make it last, you know. Sometimes it's just a few seconds, a bar or two. Mm -hmm. With a group, sometimes mm -hmm. you can get, like for example, the real group's recording of Silent Night. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that is incredible. And if I listen to it, it doesn't make a difference how many times I've listened to it. There's some diminuendos and retards that are just, I know, they just, they struck gold there in mm -hmm. that studio doing that. And there are moments in the high lows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody, but that's one in particular, that Silent Night recording of uh, the real group that uh, never fails to. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think they could, I think it happened to them, I mean, they were ready, mm -hmm. but it wasn't anything. It was just one of those magical moments, like God came down and said, "All right, this is going to be it. Yeah. You're going to do that beautiful retard and diminuendo." Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, gosh, yeah. makes me want to go listen to it right now. Oh, yeah, I haven't yeah. listened to it for a while. I think yeah. I'll do it on YouTube this afternoon. Just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I um, have worked with you so much, and I say work with you because I was technically only your student for two, sure, two right. years or something. Yeah. But, um, when I said something about Jason being my best student, yeah. I really meant that. But on the other hand, I was thinking, well, you were, but you weren't really a student mm -hmm. in that same sense as Jason was. Yeah. Right. But on the other hand, being around you so many years, and watching you mentor others and run rehearsals and lead uh, events uh -huh. has been an ongoing lesson for me. Yes. And it still is ongoing. Even the mm -hmm. clinic we did two days ago over at Dallas Grimes High right. School, I watched you work with that yeah. group. And I noticed that you can pick one or two points uh, about music that you want to convey. And you get at the heart of it in a way that everyone's sensibility about music is elevated. 
And oh. then all of the other musical aspects rise along with it. So you don't have to nitpick every measure and every chord and every tuning and every blend point. You pick one or two things and get them to a really higher aesthetic level. But you do that as well, I see. I've, I've observed you. and Well, then I learned it from you. Well, you, you have a really positive way of working with a choir that really makes them want to, well, to work you. with you. And sometimes that's not, doesn't work that way for me exactly. Mm. I mean, if you can take a choir that's really not very good at all and make them feel good, I find that hard, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I, and I just have this memory of, uh, we were in Sacramento, California, somewhere at the Stan Kenton uh, some jazz summer workshop. jazz workshop. Mm -hmm. And it was the only time that he did vocal jazz at that workshop, right? Mm -hmm. And you were there as... And he was alive. I mean, it was He his, was alive. Yes, oh yeah, he was yeah. there. And so in the final concert on Friday or when it was, you sang Stormy Weather, right? Mm -hmm. And Stan is sitting there at the piano there were two pianos out there, I guess. And he's sitting there looking at you with his hand up there or something and just smiling and enjoying uh, it, you know? Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful scene, watching him watch you and just, you know, mm -hmm. saying, yeah, you know. Because he always loved singers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he promoted the four freshmen and June Christie and mm -hmm. Chris Connor and mm -hmm. I need all day. Mm -hmm. Wow! Yeah. For being an instrumental guy, he really yeah. yeah he, he he was a great uh, vocal. Well, we could supporter. say the same about you for being a, a, an instrumental guy. You seem to like singers pretty well. How did that happen for you? Um. You know, if you want to know. It happened because when I was playing, starting to play jazz in my 13 or 14 years old, um, what was going on in jazz at that point was bebop, hard bop. It was a very kind of aggressive, almost angry, competitive scene. and. Uh, it turned me off. But what turned me on was listening to uh, Frank Sinatra and Sarah Vaughan and Ella and Doris Day with Nelson Riddle arrangements. So uh, I preferred to listen to beautiful arrangements with beautiful singers rather than Monk. For example, oh, I like him now, but at the time, mm -hmm. he was so unpianistic mm -hmm. I, I, that I, I, I couldn't appreciate it. I would, I would like Oscar Peterson, mm -hmm. but I couldn't play like Oscar, right? Errol Garner, yeah. Errol was marvelous in a different way. Mm -hmm. But Oscar, you know, he'd make you want to just take up McDonald's. Yeah, knitting or yeah, something. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, but he felt that way about um, what's his name? What's his name? Errol. I'm uh, not Errol Garner. Uh, who's Art Tatum? Oh, yes. Oscar felt that way about yeah, Art Tatum. Right. So yeah. Uh, yes. Well, it's wonderful they have those models of. Uh, you know, musical genius. I mean, if everybody listens to Mozart and says, well, I'm not going to do that because I couldn't possibly mm -hmm. write Mozart or Brahms or, or Bach even more, right? But they're there as uh, beautiful mentors, if you will. Mm -hmm. You study their music and you learn from it. And, mm -hmm. and just to throw this in, I learned the most, actually. Well, I, I learned so much by studying 
Gene Perling's mm. arrangements <laughs> and Clark Fisher's arrangements, right? Mm -hmm. In order to get ready to teach them at Foothill and other places. And that was just a, you know, a textbook on how to write for voices. Mm -hmm. The high lows, singers unlimited, two plus two, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then now the real group in the same way and New York voices. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think everybody went to the Gene Perling school mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. And uh, although Gene, Gene was not a, a scholarly teacher, but he was the, the, the teacher. And then if you go back, of course, then Mel Torme was a great teacher in a lot of ways with the Meltones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the arrangers for the high lows, or excuse me, the poor freshmen. Uh, although that, those arrangements were not as complex mm -hmm. as the high lows. Yeah. They were still lovely, and they still are lovely. Mm -hmm. And they're great uh, arrangements for high school groups, for example, mm -hmm. to do. Not that they're that easy, but yeah, yeah. they're quite singable. Yeah. Um, what would you like to say to um, educational or semi-professional choral directors and conductors? What would I like to say? If you could say anything in the world to offer them something that might be of value or of interest, what would it be? Well, try to be thankful for the gifts of music and try to work on the philosophy of that. And then try to understand and affirm the fact that you don't know very much and that you're a student mm -hmm. and that you always need to feel like a student. Even though you're the teacher, you, you have plenty to learn. And uh, and so, so, don't feel like you have to profess that you know a lot, because ultimately you don't. It's not the truth, mm -hmm. right? You're you're. It's just not. It's not a defensible position. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's quite easy to say, "Well, I'm a student, and I'm still learning. I may be a little farther along the path than you, who are you know 13 years old, and mm -hmm. I've got a degree." But you don't want to adapt that as a, I'm up here and you're down here. Mm -hmm. Make it more, more a collaborative mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the students will respond to that. And uh, not everybody will, but they, you know, they should if they have any intelligence at all, they can see that. And how about that? There's a teacher who doesn't mm -hmm. claim to know it all. Yeah. yeah, so hmm. I, I would say that. Mm -hmm. What would you um, like to tell to students out there, to aspiring singers, arrangers, people that want to have a career in vocal group music or music in general? Well, it's a wonderful field, but it it's extremely demanding and competitive, if you will. So it doesn't make a whole, you can have great talent, but you won't be competitive unless you spend serious time developing that talent. That would be my suggestion. It's relatively easy to go on your talent when you're in high school or college even, but uh, at a certain point there's also talented people who have paid more dues and if, if you haven't paid those dues then uh, they're going to get the job and you're not going to. Bobby McFerrin had a wonderful quote about that, do you remember mm -hmm. about that? Mm -hmm. It was about, uh, it, it had a biblical reference, it was like unless you 
you sow with tears and reap with joy, and unless you sow, mm -hmm. which is practice, there's no uh, reaping the joy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly that, but it had that same, it had a little religious connotation yeah. to it. Yeah. I remember hearing Bobby say one time something about how people tend to assume he was born being able to do what he does, and they have no idea how much practice he right. has put in to yeah. it. And it's true. You tend to think, oh, well, he's brilliant. He is brilliant, but still, yeah. it didn't come for free. No. And, uh, no. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, how many hours did you practice piano when you were younger? I didn't practice a lot when I was, uh, you know, in high school or before. I did play a lot, but I didn't practice my lessons. I did spend a lot of time just finding chords and things like that. Mm -hmm. I didn't practice seriously until, uh, really seriously, disciplined way until uh, in my mid-twenties when I decided that I really wanted to, to do music and I needed to, uh, I needed to uh, catch up because I had actually gotten out of music for a while. And so I did practice then. I think for five years or so I never went to bed until I had spent at least three hours at the piano mm -hmm. for five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not a lot. But I was also doing full-time school and work, and mm -hmm. so it was always a, a fair amount of time. For me, it was all I could do. But I think that's where I earned my spurs, if you will, mm -hmm. if, if, if I have any spurs. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're working with, with jazz singers, because you're still currently playing with singers in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and we're doing something here, and you, you're doing, still playing a lot. Yeah. Ah. What do you, what thrills you, or what do you like or appreciate or get excited about when you are working with a singer? Well, most importantly is that they're listening more than they're singing, and that they do it differently every time, or, you know, close to differently. Yeah, that one thing is everything, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's nothing you can memorize. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't memorize it. So, uh, yeah, that's the beauty of all art, I guess, is that you can't memorize it, and you can't follow somebody else. Mm -hmm. You can't copy somebody else. You may have models when you're young, and you listen to Ella and mm -hmm. Bobby McFerrin and the real group and the Singers Unlimited, but what they know and did is not... You may have something better to offer than they did, but you'll never get it by trying to copy them. Mm -hmm. But at first, you, you do copy, mm -hmm. pretty, obviously, but pretty soon. It has to be spontaneous creation right now to really be alive. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, I can remember in particular when I first got my position at Foothill College, mm -hmm. where we met. Yeah. Uh, for the first uh, year or two, everything I did was a copy of my college choral director, uh, Paul Christensen from Concordia College in Moorhead. I mean, just about everything, you know. Yeah. And there were some parts of that that were really me that continued to be me. But there was quite a bit of it that was not necessarily me. And I had to use different words. Uh, and it was certainly a wonderful model for me. But inspiration, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, 
Mm -hmm. From him I got especially the idea that the fate of the world rested on <laughs> getting that chord in tune, right? <laughs> You were, you know. That, that sounds very important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fate of In the other world. words, yeah. It's. It, I mean, I know everybody's serious. Um, I remember that with you when I was in your concert choir. Quite literally, the only time ever I was in a concert choir in in university oh. or even high school. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? That's yeah. the only choir I was ever in. <laughs> but um, I remember, uh, even if you were sick, I remember one time we had a performance coming up and you were really seriously should have been in bed you had a fever of 101 and you were you know sounded awful and uh, you had no voice you worked so hard to rehearse I can't remember that, that rehearsal I think it had something to do with my teeth maybe or something but I remember I was miserable if we're talking about the same but you but, gave 180% yeah. still yeah. It's uh, like Kant, the philosopher, the German Kant. It's not what you. Do, it's what you do when you don't feel like it that mm -hmm. counts. Mm -hmm. Which I don't know if that's true or not, but that was one of his the virtue. Or yeah, virtue is is doing it, doing the right thing when you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. when you don't doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And that's. Uh, I'm not saying I am a model for that at all. But that was uh, categorical. He was he called it the categorical, categorical imperative. That was Kant's word for that idea that the only virtuous act is yeah. doing something right when you when you didn't want to. Just choosing to do it even do it. though you didn't feel like you it. didn't feel like it, or there was no reward, or mm. for you. Or in fact, there may have been a dis reward, you know. Who is your favorite author? Well, I have many favorite authors, but two philosophers that I read, I've read and reread and reread are um, the novelist philosopher Ayn Rand, or Ayn Rand, and um, the religious philosophical writer, uh, Krishnamurti. So I, I've been influenced greatly by both of those. And they come, they kind of come from opposite ends of the spectrum philosophically. And Rand said the highest virtue is you need to live for your own good. She, it was called the virtue of selfishness, but it was basically your life is yours, sacred to live, and you don't owe it to the state or anybody, even to your father or mother if they're asking something that's going to involve a big sacrifice on your part. You're not obligated to that. And then Krishnamurti, whose idea was we want to search for truth and Truth is a pathless land, and love happens when the self is absent. So the self has to be absent to find this oneness with the world, mm -hmm. if you will. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the highest psychological, spiritual state that you could be in, where your, your self is absent. So divorce yourself from the ego right. side, so yeah. you're open to be to give right. and receive to right. Yeah, humility would be the ultimate virtue, but it's not something that you can earn or claim mm -hmm. because you may say, "Well, I'm humble," and then the next minute you'll find yourself thinking or acting in some way which is not humble. Mm -hmm. There's no final claim. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Well, I'm not sure this last question will top what we've been talking about, but it's it's an important philosophical question. Oh dear. No pun intended. I hate that. I hate yeah. that philosophical. Question. I know. I know. It gets so old. But here's your question: Where is love, and does it fall from skies above? Oh, I knew you. Why did I think no, you were going to ask about love? Yeah. Uh, 
And who is the author of that song? Because I thought it was Burt Bacharach, but I guess but it it's is not. But it's Barb Howard. Did you look? No, I didn't look it up. Okay. It's, uh, I guess, we I guess uh, we'll look it up Yahoo later, would have it, wouldn't it, or whatever. Yeah, you yeah. can Google it. Yeah, Google. Google would have it, yeah. Um, I don't know. That's the answer. Uh, it's a... Uh, my best definition would be, like Christian Murray, it's a, it's a state of being where it's not that you love something or somebody loves you or you love someone. It's a state of being where the self, the ego, is receded or absent. Mm -hmm. And then you can approach everybody without an agenda. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, to to, like to live mm -hmm. and to meet other people without an agenda. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. Yeah. Do you because, think about that as you're going through your day? Uh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. I I kind of grade myself, if you will, or not grade myself. But I'm, I'm self-checking, you know, mm -hmm. because you know our it, it's it's not normal to not have an agenda as a human being. Mm -hmm. talk, you know, our agenda is to stay alive, right? <laughs> and to get, get some food, food and clothing, and then get some love and, mm -hmm. and uh, the hierarchy of needs. Right. So so that business of uh, not having an agenda would be a you know a really advanced, if you will, or some would say it's a it's a bad state, but it's it would be an advanced state of being. Mm -hmm. And I can see. I mean, you could see if you if you did that, how people would gravitate to you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because uh, you would hardly have to say anything. It would just be, here I am, here we are. <laughs> that's, that's just enjoy the moment, huh? Mm -hmm. Like that, I'm enjoying this interview. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad, me too. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. It is nice to let go of just the weight, the mental weight of I never thought of it as an agenda, but yeah, it is kind of a uh, it is kind of a weighty agenda, and it puts you in the present or in the past of worrying about stuff. It puts you in the future of uh, what do I need to do next, and so you're worrying about that, and then coming in with no agenda is a way of existing in this moment, which is very yeah. freeing. Well, I. I I wouldn't know because I, I, I can't achieve that. I mean, I've done, uh, but it's certainly, because it's necessary as a human being to think about tomorrow in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be just a matter of balance so you don't spend too much worry about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And certainly not about the past. Um, to tr as we said, maybe we said earlier, the, the truth can't be spoken in words. You can try, mm. but you can spend hours trying to define where's love, <laughs> <laughs> and not get, and run out of time before you run out of before you actually get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Anyway, I love you. Oh, How's that? That's, I love you too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here and, and talking with us, Phil. You're welcome. You're, you're so important to me, and you have been my life uh, mentor in music, and I, I, I'm yep. forever in your, in your, your debt for that. Right. Um, and that's what we do, you know. I'm forever in the debt of several people. Mm. Yes. Is there anything you want to say in, in closing 
words of wisdom, the meaning of life. I think we've covered it, but... Yeah, I think, you know, one of the greatest days God ever had was when he created Harley Davidson's. Just um, remember how important that is. Don't make me cry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Phil, All right. thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. There is philmatson.com. There's also the philmatsonsingers.com. Not the, just philmatsonsingers. Sorry. philmatsonsingers.com. And Phil has some, uh, probably some performing coming up with that group that you can check out and also recordings that you may not know about that he has with some solo singers from Minneapolis and probably other areas and so on. So, um, yeah, and of course, check back with Mish Music and Mish Talk uh, because we have lots of other interviews coming all the time with wonderful, brilliant people like Phil. No one as brilliant as Phil, but others that are similarly brilliant uh, from around the world. So thanks so much, and thank you, Phil, for being here. You're welcome, Michelle. Mish. <laughs>